Good afternoon. As we gather here this afternoon, we welcome all who are here. May God bless us as we worship him. We welcome Pastor Hunt, who will be preaching us in this hour. May you also be blessed as you deliver your message. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 106, verses 4 and 5. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have toward your people. O visit me with your salvation, that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory in your inheritance. Let us sing Psalter 345, verses 1 and 2. 345, verses 1 and 2. Greetings, brothers and sisters, as we gather together on this Lord's Day afternoon to confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us sing together Psalter 129.
Father, while we offer this prayer, we will offer it to you in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, coming in Christ in union with him, with deep gratitude for all your mercies. Lord, would your mercies take possession of all our hearts? That is, when, when David sat in his house of cedar, he, he magnified the Lord. And so, may we also, whenever things seem to go smoothly with us, may we magnify you. Lord, may the gratitude that we feel prompt us to yet say again, what shall I render the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Lord, would you make every child of yours here to be serving you each and every day and serving you so that heaven's work may begin here below, something of heaven's pleasure be enjoyed even now as we seek first your kingdom and its righteousness. But Lord, while we work for you, always keep us sitting at the feet of Jesus. Let our faith never wander away from the simplicity of its confidence in Him. And let our, even our motives never be anything but for His glory. May our hearts be taken up with His love and our, our thoughts perpetually engaged about His person and His work. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in Your sight, our rock and our Redeemer. Let us choose that good part which shall not be taken away from us. Let this church, Lord, receive that, that fresh, Lord, this, this work of your spirit in our hearts that we would not rely upon some past experience, but always, Lord, be seeking for your illumination, for the renewing of our mind each and every day that we might be spending ourselves and being spent for the sake of the Master, for the sake of your kingdom. So quicken us, we pray you, in all our education, in our homes, Lord, every family worshiped a time that we have with our families, Lord, may there be no lack of good, solid education in our homes as we read the Bible, we sing the Bible, we pray the Bible, we hear it read. And Lord, as we come each Lord's Day to hear the Bible read and sung and prayed and preached and even seen and experienced in the sacraments, Lord, may our young children find it a delight to sit at the feet of Christ in His Word. And Lord, may our parents and teachers, Lord, find it a delight to teach these little ones. Lord, give us a, a superabundance of workers for your harvest. Lord, we long for more churches to be full, for the work of the ministry to go on and for places that have not heard of the gospel, Lord, to have new churches planted. We long for this, Lord, in, the, in even the darkest parts of both Canada and U.S., but across the, the world, Lord, there are so many places who have not heard even of Jesus himself, much less how they can have salvation. Oh, Lord, would you not prosper the work of your church? Bless us, we pray you. May they, each and every one of your children, Lord, recognize that they are called to a purpose, to glorify you, to enjoy you forever. Lord, would you keep us in our daily labors as we go throughout this coming week to our labors, Lord, that you would help us to be mindful that we ought to serve those who are our bosses as if we are serving you and working for you yourself. Help us to be faithful to you in our words and our actions and in our thoughts to glorify you in all our homes and in our workplaces, among our neighbors and in our families. Lord, and all the thousand and one things which are our activities that we contemplate and that we partake in, would you prosper us as far as they are according to your mind? And may it please you to give to the church's prayer in proportion to activity that we would not be so involved in the activity that we forget to read your word and to pray, to be giving ourselves fully to the 
word, sacraments, and prayer, this means of grace, Lord, that you have given to us. Oh, Lord, visit your church. Revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. Your mercy, Lord, would you in that revive among us a love of the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. We would pray, Lord, that you would rebuke those who with their philosophy and vain deceit would seek to mar and spoil the gospel of Christ. Grant that in all deliberations of any part of your church which concern this great and grievous and crying evil, there may be a, a, a great wisdom given to help them and that all of their actions, Lord, might be done and ordered according and for your glory. Lord, we ask that you would bless our nations, Canada, the U.S., Lord, and we pray that you would let that spirit of Christianity permeate through it, even into the high places of our magistrates, and flow down even to the darkest of dens where sin abides. We beseech you that you would grant us peace. May nothing happen to break it, Lord, if our peace is in Christ, that it would not be dependent upon our current circumstances, but that this peace, Lord, would come from above, a peace that this world knows nothing about. Lord, help us to permeate our own souls with that peace as we read your word and find that you always keep your promises May the gospel of Jesus Christ permeate into the remotest regions and every one of our neighbors and co-workers hear the gospel and then hear about Jesus Christ who was lifted up for our transgressions. Lord, we lift up before you Martha Vischer and ask that you would give the doctors wisdom as she goes to these appointments and Lord is struggling with her health. We ask that you would... Lord, keep in mind the, the, the Vanderhart family, the one we prayed for this morning who has passed into glory. Lord, our heart goes out to the family, especially to Joanne and Mary, and we ask that you would comfort them with a comfort that only you can give, knowing that we, both in life and in death, do not belong to ourselves, but to you. Now, Lord, help us each this afternoon to give, Lord, our, to give our attention to the reading and preaching of your word. Give everyone here a sense of pardon sin, that we are forgiven but for the sake of Christ. And give to each one of us also a sanctifying power, that as you have begun a good work in us, that we ought to work our salvation out with fear and trembling, knowing that you began the good work in us and you have promised that you will complete it until the day of Christ. Give power in the delivery of the gospel this afternoon and all the, your faithful churches throughout the land. And may the truth sink into our soul and, and may this be a good and happy and devout and beneficial occasion to all of us here who are gathered. We, Lord, bring before you uh, thanks for all that you have given to us. And we ask that you would receive our offering as we bring it to you, Lord, with a heart that overflows in thankfulness, but also recognizing that this is for the sake of the ministry, especially today as we support the Safe Families Niagara. Lord, that this would be a ministry, Lord, that you prosper by your hand, all for the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Numbers 21. I save the reading of this to go right from a short introduction. We will pray, we'll read the text, and then shortly thereafter, I will have you turn to John chapter 3 as well if you wish to place a bookmark there. Our congregation has been working our way through the book of Numbers in our afternoon service, and I found the book of Numbers has far surpassed any expectations that we might have had. But I have to admit, it is kind of like a kid going to a candy shop when we get to this passage, although I assure you, it is even better than any candy store that you could go to. Let me begin by saying that even as, as a kid, I would read John chapter 3 verse 14 and wonder why it would be that God would foreshadow the eternal Son of God hanging upon the cross with a snake on a pole. That befuddled me to, to no end. And quite frankly, it kind of bothered me. It seemed almost blasphemous to me since it was a serpent that tempted Eve in the garden. And, and here this Jesus is saying, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so before we read the Word of God, let us pray and ask God's Spirit to renew our minds and illumine our hearts for the reading and preaching of His Holy Word. Our Heavenly Father, if this is Your Word and we ask that You'd open our eyes to behold wonderful things in your law. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let us give our attention to the reading of God's holy, inerrant word, reading Numbers chapter 21. The king of Arad, the Canaanite who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Athiram. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of that place was called Hormah. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, He lived. Now the children of Israel moved on and camped at Oboth. And they journeyed from Oboth and camped at Ejet Abiram, in the wilderness, which is east of Moab, toward the sunrise. From there they moved and camped in the valley of Zered. From there they moved and camped on the other side of the Arnon, which is in the wilderness that extends from the border of the Amorites, for the Arnon is the border of Moab between Moab and the Amorites. Therefore, it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, Wahab and Sufa, the brooks of the Arnon, and the slope of the brooks that reaches to the dwelling of Aar and lies on the border of Moab. From there they went to Beer, which is the well where the Lord said to Moses, Gather the people together and I will give them water. Then Israel sang this song. Spring up, O well, all of you sing to it. The well, the leader sang, dug by the nation's nobles, by the lawgiver with their staves. And from the wilderness they went to Matana, from Matana to Nahiel, Haliel, from Nahaliel to Bamoth, and from Bamoth in the valley that is in the country of Moab to the top of Pisgah, which looks down on the wasteland. 
Then Israel sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through your land. We will not turn aside into fields or vineyards. We will not drink water from wells. We will go by the king's highway until we have passed through your territory. But Sion would not allow Israel to pass through this territory. So Sion gathered all his people together and went out against Israel in the wilderness. And he came to Jehaz and fought against Israel. Then Israel defeated him with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land from the Arnon to the Jabbok, as far as the people of Ammon, for the border of the people of Ammon was fortified. So Israel took all these cities, and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites, in Heshbon, and in all its villages. For Heshbon was the city of Sion, king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab, and had taken all his land from his hand as far as the Arnon. Therefore those who speak in Proverbs say, Come to Heshbon, let it be built. Let the city of Sion be repaired. For fire went out from Heshbon, a flame from the city of Sihon. It consumed Ar of Moab, the lord of the heights of the Arnon. Woe to you, Moab, you have perished, O people of Chemosh. He has given his sons as fugitives and his daughters into captivity to Sion, king of the Amorites. But we have shot at them. Heshbon has perished as far as Dibon. Then we laid waste as far as Nophah, which reaches to Medaba. Thus Israel went and dwelt in the land of the Amorites. Then Moses sent to spy out Jazer, and they took its villages and drove out the Amorites who were there. And they turned and went up by the way of Bashan. So Og, king of Bashan, went out against them, he and all his people, to battle at Edre. Then the Lord said to Moses, do not fear him, for I have delivered him into your hand with all his people and his land. And you shall do to him as you did to Sion, king of the Amorites, who dwelt at Heshbon. So they defeated him, his sons, and all his people, until there was no survivor left him, and they took possession of his land. All flesh is as grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever. This afternoon we are looking at a very refreshing passage. So often when we think about the book of Numbers, we think of it in terms of, well, numbers and names, villages and cities we can't pronounce. But tonight we're looking at victory and repentance. Tonight's account reminds us that whenever God takes you down a long and a difficult road, there are sure times that God gives refreshment to his people. There is victory. There is peace for those who repent. Well, sometimes that road can be 40 years long. Sometimes it can take 40 years until you learn your lesson and finally repent. But yes, there is a warning here. Not everyone repents. And so as we go through our passage, let us learn to repent and believe the gospel. You can find this outline in your bulletin if you wish to follow along. Repent. Look to Jesus and live. Repent, look to Jesus and live because he sets the prisoners free. He saves believers from eternal death. He satisfies the thirst of his people and his steadfast love endures forever. Repent, look to Jesus and live. Our text begins here in these first three verses to give us a little bit of geography, and that might seem a little odd, but Arad is north of Edom along the west side of the Dead Sea. And there is around 30 miles of wilderness between Arad and the route that Israel is taking. And if they're heading south to go around Edom, then many have wondered, well, what is going on here? It seems like Arad is really bent on confronting the Israelites. Well, before the people began their march around the country of Edom, the king of Arad, who is a Canaanite, we are told in this text, he inhabited the southern part of the country, attacked them in the wilderness, and he took some prisoners. It could have led Israel into great despondency. 
What are we going to do now? But this led the Israelites to look more thoroughly to the Lord, which is what every trial and tribulation that we must face ought to do for us. Help us to look more to the Lord and less focus on our present circumstances and on the woes that we find ourselves in. Because we will find that it is the Lord who sets the prisoner free. Israel makes a vow to God to do what God had already called them to do. God had given them a command. And so their vow said, if, if God, God if, you, if you will deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. Well, this is a promise that God had made to them already, that if they will be his people and he will be their God, and they go forth in his name, that he would give them all these cities. And they would utterly destroy them. They were to devote the Canaanite cities to the ban. That is, to complete destruction, to utterly annihilate them. You'll remember, though, that the wickedness of the Canaanites had not yet been filled up, he told Abraham. And so, God's people were to wait several hundred years, over 400 years before entering back into this promised land. And now the iniquity of the Canaanites had been filled. So they come and they attack Israel and capture some of them. But notice what they do. They cry out to the Lord. If you read through the book of Exodus and Numbers, this almost sounds like a stark contrast to the Israel that you know. What? Israel, you're finally learning your lesson to cry out to the Lord. And he delights to hear them and he answers swiftly. The Lord hears their cry and he delivers them out of the hand of their enemies. A foretaste of what was to come if they would only continue to follow his commands. So the lesson you must learn from Israel is to repent, look to Jesus, and live because he sets the prisoner free. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10 that these things that happened to Israel, yes, the things here in Exodus and Numbers, some of these books that you might find a little tedious to read through, but they happened for you, that you may learn from the mistakes that they made, so that you may learn to repent, look to Jesus, and live. Because he sets a prisoner free. Secondly, he saves believers from eternal death. We get to verse 4, and they journey from Mount Hor, we see, by the way of the Red Sea, to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people, it says, was much discouraged because of the way. Here at last, as you know the history of Israel, this is their final grumble, well, at least against Moses. There will be at least another rebellion that we encounter in the book of Numbers, but this is the last one against Moses. And we're told why in verse number four. They have to go around Edom. That's an extra 200 miles of walking. Now, it's true that they had to walk further than this from Sinai to Kadesh, but that was 40 years ago. For the last 40 years, they haven't really gone very far. Perhaps many of them had gotten somewhat settled at Kadesh, Many of the young people, no doubt, would have been born during this time. They did not remember the journey from Egypt. For we are about at a time when only those 20 years old and younger would still be around from those who left the land of Egypt. Of course, the exceptions, notably, would have been Joshua and Caleb, and we know Moses and Aaron in this chapter are still around. But 200 miles on foot through a hot desert with flocks and herds and screaming children, all that's going to take a long time. And so they start grumbling again. And the text says that the people spake against God. First and foremost, they spake against God. Then they spoke against Moses. 
often they are complaining just against Moses, it seems. But here, it seems that they recognize that they, first and foremost, their complaints were against God. How often we think that we're just complaining about our present circumstance. But we're reminded over and over that God's works of providence are His most holy, wise, and powerful, governing and preserving all His creatures and all their actions, whatever circumstance that we might be in, God has ordained for that to be. And when we murmur and complain about our present circumstance, ultimately we are first and foremost speaking against God. And here's Israel's complaint. Why in the world, Moses, did you bring us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread. There's no water. In fact, our, our soul loathes this light bread, as it says. Now, mind you, God had given them bread. In fact, the Psalms tell us He gave them the bread of angels, bread from heaven. And their soul loathes that. You will learn from the end of Deuteronomy, the reason God had given them man in the wilderness was for the very fact that they are to learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And here they are loathing it. Here they are despising it. This light bread, this manna from heaven, this bread of angels. There's no water here. They had complained, of course, other times about water. You remember one time Moses struck the rock and out came water just as God commanded. Another time Moses was supposed to speak to the rock, but instead he struck the rock. And once again, water came out miraculously from this, this rock. But this time there's no reference to Moses falling on his face before the Lord. Usually when the people complain against Moses, especially about the water situation, Moses falls on his face, but here there doesn't seem to be, and God's reply actually seems quite swift and sudden, because right away we find the Lord sends fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. Now you, you know this, as you have walked through the Bible, that serpents are regularly seen in the Bible as a sign of judgment, as a sign of curse, ever since the Garden of Eden. Remember Exodus 7, Moses cast down, its rod, cast down his rod and it became this great sea serpent, or so the Hebrew word is, and swallowed up all the other serpent rods of Pharaoh's magicians. And later in the prophets, Pharaoh will be compared to this great sea serpent. And so the judgment of serpents seems to be actually quite fitting here. They wanted to go back to Egypt. So here you go. Here's what was in Egypt. Serpents. You want to be under the serpent rule of Pharaoh? Fine. Here you go. Here's what it's like. The sting of the serpent, like the sting of a whip. Of course, you know this. I mean, most of these people probably did never experienced Egypt. Some of those who were older, well, they may have remembered it when they, from childhood, but most of these people would not have known what Egypt was like. So here's a good reminder. You want the fiery serpent rule of Pharaoh? I'll give you a fiery serpent rule. Those of you who are young in the congregation, young boys and girls, you grew up in a Christian home, that is a wonderful privilege. Don't ever despise it. Don't ever wonder, well, I wonder what it seems like my worldly friends seem to have all sorts of fun. Beware, because God might give you the fiery serpent lesson. Israel has succumbed to the same deception as Eve did in the garden. I mean, think about how Jesus endured the tempter in the wilderness, recapitulating Israel's temptations in the desert. The difference is where Israel fails, where they fall, Jesus succeeds. He overcomes temptation by the Word of God. He did not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But here in Numbers, this most amazing moment happens. 
Verse 7, the, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. They recognized the judgment of God. We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And so Moses intercedes for these people. He prays for them. Now what has been missing thus far in the book of Numbers, as you count back, there were six other rebellions that have happened thus far. What's different in the seventh rebellion? What makes this different? Israel repents. Israel repents. God's people repent of their rebellion. Moses and Aaron have interceded for Israel, but Israel never before had confessed their sin. God had had mercy on his people, and he does again. But this is the first time we see Israel confessing their sin. Israel before had never repented. Now they repent. This is a great model for repentance in our own hearts. We have sinned. Start with that. We have sinned. There are no excuses offered. Well, we were hungry, we were thirsty, we were tired. Just an acknowledgement of guilt. And then the sin is clearly identified. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. This is exciting. Israel, you've, you've learned your lesson. When you sin, a simple acknowledgement, I have sinned against you. I've sinned against Moses. Brothers and sisters, don't you realize how exciting this is? The death of Aaron symbolized this transition. But here we have the substance of the change. Without repentance, the cycles of sin and death, sin and death, sin and death will go on forever. Own up to your sin and call it sin. And if you keep trying to excuse and justify yourself, you're just going to remain bitten in the wilderness because you are not good enough to get into the promised land on your own merits. You cannot get there with a the righteousness of your own. You need the righteousness of another. It is Paul's brilliant way of saying it in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. They've done it in the past, and it has ongoing consequences for even now. And they fall short. They come short of the glory of God. This is an ongoing consequence of our present sin. All have sinned and therefore are coming short of God's glory. So what do we do? We repent. It is so easy to make excuses and try to justify our sin Rather than just confess it, humble yourself, repent of your sins, confess it and ask God to forgive you and ask those you sinned against to forgive you as well. And so notice that Israel comes to Moses. We have also sinned against you. Now, there's nothing in this passage to suggest that the people were coming to Moses and complaining to him, as we have seen before, Almost appears as if people were grumbling behind his back. But notice the next part. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. They recognize that they have sinned. They have sinned against the Lord's anointed. And they realize that he is the only one who can intercede for him. He is the only one who can intercede on their behalf. Numbers 21 is not saying you need to ask people to forgive you. Numbers 21 is saying that when you sin against God, you are sinning against the Lord's anointed. You are sinning against Jesus. And Jesus is the only one who can intercede for you. Moses, he intercedes on behalf of the people, but he's imperfect. Fact is, he sins, and he will die because of that sin. Fact is, he will not even get to see the promised land, but from a distance. And so the Lord says to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it up on a pole, 
And it will come to pass that everyone that is bitten and he looks upon it shall live. And so what does Moses do? He obeys. Moses made a serpent of brass, bronze, brazen serpent here, and, and he puts it on a pole, and it comes to pass that whenever a serpent had bitten somebody, as long as he looked up and saw this serpent, he lived. But of course you say, well, this brazen serpent is a sign of the curse. It's a sign of judgment. And here in Numbers 21, it seems to take that curse and judgment and turn it into a sign of triumph. A triumph over sin, over rebellion. Why? Because God is more powerful than that serpent. And when you turn and you look to that serpent on the pole, you are acknowledging that you have sinned and you need God's mighty power. Jesus himself said that this passage was really about him. Earlier I had you put a, a bookmark in John chapter 3. Let me read John three fourteen to 16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a glorious picture. You might not have made that connection, aside from Jesus telling us of this great connection. Think about how John puts it in John chapter 8. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. Or, or a little bit later in John, and if I, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to me. You see, on the cross, Jesus was lifted up. On the cross, He became the curse. He became, received the, the judgment of God, the wrath and curse of God due to us for our sins. But it was also there on the cross that He triumphed over sin. On the cross, Jesus was lifted up so that whoever looks to the Son of Man and believes in Him will have everlasting life. This brazen serpent re remained a sign actually for hundreds of years for Israel. We're told that in Hezekiah's day, it was finally broken because the people of Israel were at this time were making offerings to it. Oh, isn't that itself a reminder that sometimes we take good things, even things that God himself has given to us, even things that God has appointed, and we can even turn those things into idolatry. And when that happens, they need to be destroyed. If King Hezekiah destroyed the bronze serpent that God had commanded Moses to make, how much more should we be willing to destroy the works of our own hands, especially when they become a stumbling block to true holiness, to true worship before God? So repent. Look to Jesus and live. Because he sets the prisoners free, he saves believers from eternal death. Thirdly, he satisfies the thirst of his people. Israel now comes to these waters of how you'd say it in Hebrews, but ear. Of course, it looks like beer in our English translation. And it kind of sounds funny. But they describe their journey around Edom and their arrival at the northern border of Moab. Verses 14 and 15 actually quote from this ancient book, the book of the wars of, of Yahweh. Wherefore, it is said the book of the, in the book of the wars of the Lord, what he did in the Red Sea and the brooks of Arnon and at the stream of the books that goeth down to the dwelling of Arnon and lieth upon the border of Moab. Now, we don't really know anything about this book that it's referencing other than this reference here. And I think there's a couple references in the books of Samuel. But it's a reminder that there were other ancient texts and that not all ancient texts were deemed Scripture. But it is included here and therefore sacred Scripture. 
But verses 16 to 18 then describe a very important event. Because it was from there they went to Beer, and that is the well whereof the Lord spake unto Moses, Gather the people together, and I will give them water. Then Israel sang, up, sang this song, Spring up, O well, sing unto it. Now, you just remember they, they had been murmuring and complaining because they didn't have water. They repented. And the next thing we're reading is God says, I will give them water. And as you read down through this passage, you see that they're actually digging it up with, with staves, with staffs, here, here, with the scepters and such. And maybe seem odd to dig a well, not with a shovel, but with your sticks. But it was a common practice of the nobads to sometimes cover wells with sand in order to hide them. But it may be that this refers to the princes tapping the ground with their staves and covering up a well in this way. What, but the matter is, is that when Israel gets to Beer, they're doing very well. They're doing very well, which is actually what Beer means. It means well in Hebrew. And they are doing, they're doing great. They seem they have repented of their sins or they're following God. God has forgiven them. But why is this important? You see, in the previous tra chapter, Numbers chapter 20, Israel grumbles about water. And Moses strikes the rock with his staff Water comes out of the rock. So Israel grumbles and they get miraculous water. But now when Israel repents, God gives them water in the ordinary way from a well. If you need miraculous signs, it might be that you are not doing well. Your faith is weak. But Israel is now living faithfully before God. And so Israel is doing well and so they get their water in a very ordinary way. To put it simply, with miraculous signs, usually someone ends up dead. All through Exodus and Numbers, miracles end up being associated somehow with death. The signs in Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, the judgments in the wilderness, Moses striking the rock, but because of it, he is told he will die in the wilderness. It makes you wonder, do I really want to see miracles? After all, what happens when Jesus comes, a miracle worker? He dies on the cross, if I am lifted up. The very miracle of the serpent being lifted up and looking unto the serpent signified death. Someone would die in their place for their sin. We sometimes forget that uh, all of the miraculous signs that Jesus did had the singular point of showing that Jesus was the one who would take the cursed death that we deserved for our complaining and grumbling. Boys and girls, do you complain against your parents? Jesus died for the sin of grumbling. The apostles, they do signs and wonders, and most, if not all of them, guess what, were, were martyred, sharing in the sufferings of Christ, that they may be conformed to His glory. So Israel continues to move on from there. They go into Matanah, and from Matanah to Nahaliel, and from Nahaliel to Bamoth, and Bamoth in the valley in the country of Moab, to the top of Pigzka, which looketh toward Jeshimon. These two verses make clear that they have finally arrived in the plains of Moab. And there they will have a great trial. Here they will actually remain for a few months until Moses actually dies. And it's only after that that Joshua leads them into the land. All the events of the, of the last 15 chapters of Numbers, and even in, you can find portions of the book of Deuteronomy happen here at the plains of Moab. And so the first thing that happens there at Moab is conflict. So repent, look to Jesus and live because he sets the prisoners free. He saves believers from eternal death. He satisfies the thirst of his people. And lastly, his steadfast love endures forever. Here, Israel overthrows the Amorite kings who have pushed Lot back from the Jordan. There, Israel sends, men, sends messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites. 
And they say, let, let me pass through your land and we will not turn into the fields. We're not going to take all your vineyards. We'll not even drink water from the well. We'll go along by the king's highway until we get to the other side. Well, Israel sends a similar message to Zion that they had sent to Edom. That the chief difference is that Israel makes no claim to brotherhood like they did with Edom. Israel's not going to pick a fight with Edom, Moab, or Ammon. These are all their distant cousins. But Israel will pick a fight with the Amorites. And so when Sion comes out to fight, Israel does not turn aside. Sion would not suffer Israel to pass through its border. So what do they do? They gather all their people together and they go out against Israel into the wilderness. And they fight there at Jahaz. And Israel smote all of them with the edge of the sword and possessed his land from Arnon unto Jabbok. Even the children of Ammon, Israel took all their cities. They dwelt in the cities of the Amorites, in Heshbon and all the villages. And Heshbon was a city of the king, of Sion, king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and taken all his land. And so here there's this ballad singers that the numbers quotes in these proverbs here. And it gives this illustration the that really is a mocking the sons of Lot by saying the fact, guess what? We might not have seek to go on to war with you, though they will fight eventually, but we overthrew those who overthrew you. If you're into sports at all, it's kind of like beating the team that beat everyone else. I feel like now you're the best. You didn't have to play all the other teams, I guess. We overthrew them, so guess what? You better not mess with us. We have a God who fights our battles for us. Now notice that while Israel takes vengeance on the persecutors of Moab, Israel does not offer to return the land to Moab. Sion had taken the land, but they didn't give it back. They didn't say, well, this this was originally your land, so we'll give it back. No. Guess what? God gave them this land by first sending Sion, king of the Amorites, to fight and win it, and then by their loss to Israel, giving them the land. And so Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites. Once again, Moses then sends out spies to spy out Jazer, and they took the villages and drove out the Amorites that were there, and they turned and went up by the way of Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, went out against them, he and all his people, to the battle of Edre. Now, mind you, this king of Og, he was, he was like a giant guy with like six fingers on each hand and, and six toes on each foot. But here's what the Lord says to Moses. Fear not. Remember, don't fear man. Fear God. Don't fear this great giant of a king. For I have delivered him into your hand and all his people in his land, and you will do to him as you did to Sion, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. Guess what? Israel followed. They followed Moses. They followed the Lord. And they smote him and his sons and all his people until there was none left him alive. And they possessed his land as well. Now, in Deuteronomy, you hear Moses' sermons explaining how Israel was to conduct battle against the Canaanites, the Amorites, the rest of the seven nations of Canaan. Israel is to wage war of utter annihilation because the iniquity of the Canaanites was now filled. They are to eliminate these peoples from the face of the earth. And that might sound shocking, but it is shocking. It should shock us. Israel was to do in microcosm what the flood that God sent did around the whole earth to everybody save eight souls. And what God will do one day when he returns, wiping the face of the earth from all, destroying all his and our enemies. But as God said to Pharaoh through Moses, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Israel is. The firstborn of God is called to bring God's final judgment against these nations. A sign of the coming eschatological judgment of the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, that one day will come. But mind you, dear friends, the wages of sin is death. 
That is the daily wage of your sin, what you deserve each and every day for the sin that you just committed today. You deserve eternal death. All peoples deserve death and judgment. Og and Siam were probably not the worst kings who ever lived. They were probably fairly ordinary Middle Eastern princes of their day. But just as Sodom and Gomorrah were not necessarily the most wicked cities ever, so Og and Siam were probably not the most wicked princes ever. But they didn't listen to what God says. They were God's enemies. They mistreated God's people. And when ordinary rulers do not listen to what God says, when they mistreat God's people, then death and judgment will come upon them. I encourage you, maybe sometime this week or maybe even at family worship this evening, read Revelation 18 in light of Numbers 21. Because the judgment on Og and Son is simply the judgment upon Babylon. The city of man that ignores God. The city that mistreats God's people. One of the favorite psalms that our children in our church love to sing is Psalm 136. And in our Psalter, it has a refrain for his steadfast love endures forever. And the kids, of course, they know that line, even if they forget everything else. But believe it or not, as they sing over and over and over again, they actually get some of the other lines. And I remember one time asking one of those little children, uh, when I was explaining to another adult at the time of, you know, the importance of singing psalms. And I pulled one of these little children aside. I said, tell me, who's the king of the Amorites and who is the king of Bashan? And they were able to right off the top of their head just blurt it out. They knew because they knew Psalm 136. For his steadfast love endures forever. Why is it that God gave Sion and Og into the hands of the Israelites? We are told without equivocation because his mercy endureth forever. Don't ever forget that. God destroys all his and our enemies. And one day we'll destroy them because his mercy, his chesed, endures forever. So repent. Look to Jesus and live. Because he sets the prisoners free. He, he saves believers from eternal death. He satisfies the thirst of his people. His steadfast love endures forever. Repent, look to Jesus, and live. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for the merciful provision that you have given to us in the cross of Christ. O oh Lord, we ask that you'd help us to, to look when we see him there, there in our place, there for us, there bearing our just judgment when we look that we will live. For you have promised in the greatness of your love for the world that in sending your only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe on him, whosoever would look on him as he is lifted up, will not perish but have everlasting life. Heavenly Father, we've already sung this evening that we don't understand how it is that we ought to get this life from his death. But Lord, as we have sung these, your word, we believe it and we thank you for it. For it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Let us stand together and recite the Apostles' Creed that you can find on the inside front cover of your Psalter. Dear congregation, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now let us sing together Psalter number 83. Psalter number 83. After the benediction, we will sing together Psalter number 381. I look up and receive the Lord's benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace until the daybreak and the shadows flee away. Amen. Amen.